Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to my Total War Warhammer 2 Legendary Lord Lore video on Malekith and Marathi. Now, if you guys have already seen my likely Legendary Lords for the Dark Elf video, um, all the information contained in this video was part of that video. I just edited this out so people who are just looking to learn about Malekith and Marathi can just watch this video rather than watching the whole um, Likely Legendary Lords video. So if you've seen that one, feel free to skip this one and hopefully catch you on the next video instead. Um, but if you're sticking with us, uh, welcome and let's kick things off. These two are the creepy mother-son duo who really created the Dark Elves as a whole. Now it's quite hard to tell the individual stories of these two without overlapping significant portions of it, so I thought I'd tell you as kind of a blend of the two together and then at the end we'll go through some of their separate character traits on the tabletop and how that might be transferred across to Total War Warhammer. Let's kick things off and to really understand the history of these two we have to go back to the initial chaos invasion and the rule of the first Phoenix King Anarion the Defender. Now chaos really came into the Warhammer world when two portals created by a race called the Old Ones exploded and unleashed huge amounts of chaos energy all over the Warhammer world, allowing demons and all the creatures of the realm of chaos to manifest on the land of Warhammer fantasy as we know it. Now the elves were amongst the oldest races of the Warhammer world and amongst their number was a chap called Anarian. Now he was a traveler and a warrior of great repute as well. Very skilled at any kind of martial pursuit. Now he was traveling around the world as it stood at the time when the chaos portals exploded and unleashed chaos onto the world. He quickly rushed home to find the vast waves of his island home of Ulfwan completely annihilated, villages had been purged, blood, dismembered bodies, all kinds of anarchy and chaos were ruling over his once proud homeland. In kind of a last ditch attempt to save everybody, he went and he prayed to all the elven gods. And eventually he came to the shrine of Assyrian. And he knelt before in the temple of Assyrian and said he would gladly give his life if only the elven gods would stand in and intervene and save the elven people. And having said this, he stood up and in front of him was the Flame of Assyrian, which is essentially an eternal pillar of white hot flames that erupt out of this temple. And he stood in it, hoping to give his life for the salvation of the elven people. Now when he emerged on the other side of that fire, not only alive, but seemingly given a kind of new strength, a uh, super elven ability, if you will. Uh, it seemed as though the gods had answered him. And in fact, what happened is that rather than have him give his life, Assyrian blessed him with increased strength and a number of other different gifts to allow him to be the weapon with which to fight back the hordes of chaos. He strode forth out of the temple and started trying to gather an army to him to help him fight back these tides of chaos that were ravaging his homeland. On his travels, he met a chap known as Kalidor, the Dragon Tamer, who was the uh, sort of most powerful mage in Ulfwan at the time, and the two became firm friends. They went on to a place called the Anvil of Vol, where they created a new armor for him, new weapons, and they created some of the best weapons to give to the best warriors who would later on go to become the regional princes of Ulfwan. So they began to start resistance, and Arian begins to fight back the tides of chaos, and indeed, this kind of first initial wave of chaos that swept over Ulfwan, they managed to fight off, earning him the name Anarion the Defender. During this respite, Anarion met the Ever Queen Astariel, and they married and had a couple of kids. This is kind of a time of constant war, so although this initial first sort of huge surge of chaos had been fought back, chaos is still all over the place, Anarion and his armies are still constantly in action and he's just fighting all the time. Eventually a new second wave of chaos floods over Ulfwine and this one although Anarion is almost kind of an immortal at this point he's just such a powerhouse of a person but he can only be in one place at once and with the huge numbers of chaos that were sweeping over Ulfwine in this second incursion they managed to kind of get past him and start raiding the land and eventually Anarion gets word that his wife and children have been slain or more accurately his wife's body has been found and his children are missing. 
Now, Aneren doesn't know at this point that his children have actually been saved by Durfu of the Wood Elves. And to get a bit more of that story, check out my Durfu lore video popping up on the right-hand corner, or I'll include it in the description as well if you want to have a look at it there. Having received this news, Anerion just falls into a state of madness and grief and rage. And he essentially says, sod this, I'm going to use all the weapons available to me. And he flies off to a place known as the Shrine of Cain. Now, Cain is the elven god of murder. He essentially represents a lot of the bad aspects of elven personality, and he always had this mythical weapon that was said to be extremely powerful, but would curse whoever would take it up. And being this point beyond the care, Anerion is like, I'm just going to kill every single chaos fiend I can find, and I need the best weapon to do that. So he goes and he grabs the sword of Cain, and it said at that point he's cursed himself and the rest of his bloodline forever. Anerion takes the sword of Cain, starts eventually waging war against Chaos, and this lasts years, if not centuries. And this is just an ongoing battle between the elves and the forces of Chaos, a battle for survival, a seemingly unending one that will just grind away at the elves until they're extinct. Along his travels at some point, now just sort of mad with grief, mad with bloodlust, taken on a new penchant for murder. Anarion seems to, no, one's, no one witnesses this apart from Anarion himself. But Anarion comes back and he proclaims a new wife. This new wife is Morify or Marathi. And Marathi, uh, Marathi just seems to turn up and people are kind of like, where's, where's this woman come from? No one's really got the balls to ask Anarion, but the, some do, some of his closest allies do, and he says he rescued her from Slaneshi cultus. Now Slaanesh, for those of you who don't necessarily know, is essentially the chaos god of pleasures and forbidden pleasures and essentially kind of sex, rape and killing anyone while you are either having sex with them or raping them. That kind of thing. That's really Slaanesh's bag. That's what Slaanesh is into. Because killing is a pleasure, sex is a pleasure, throw in some chocolate and you're really indulging in all the pleasures of the world at once and that really gets Slaanesh off. He really enjoys that kind of thing. So she's turned up and she starts, and people are kind of suspicious of her. She's, on, she's an odd bird, shall we say. But, you know, it's an Aryan the Defender. His reputation is sterling. He's been fighting back the hordes of chaos almost, well, not quite single-handed, but really kind of being an inspirational presence for, for all the elven people and their savior. So they're like, okay, if you want to take a, another wife, you go for it, an area, and we won't stand in your way. Plus, we recognize she is hot as hell. So good for you, buddy. Eventually, they have a child, and this child is Malekith. And they raise Malekith, her in the ways of sorcery, which she seems to have a gift in, and the Narian in the ways of sort of tactics and leadership, military knowledge and martial skill as well. So he's kind of got the best of both worlds, teaching him from a very young age. At some point during the war, Anarion sets up court at a place called Nagarif. I think that's how you pronounce it. In the top left-hand corner of Ulfwan, you'll see it there. Now, just while we've got this map up, I also want to point out a couple of other places that will come up in this story or come up later on in the story that will kind of still be relevant to us. So we're starting down in the south of Ulfwan here, and this is the Shrine of Assyrian. Now, this is where Anarion went and got himself blessed by Assyrian, effectively becoming the first Phoenix King of the Elven people. And Assyrian, for those of you who don't know, is essentially the patriarch of the Elven gods, kind of like the Zeus of the Elven pantheon of gods, the giver of life, very much represented by the Phoenix. And to the north, we have the Blighted Isle, where the Shrine of Cain exists. And the Shrine of Cain is where Anarion got the Sword of Cain, which effectively cursed his bloodline, but made him a damn good murderer of all things chaos. Now, we also have the Phoenix Gate. I'd like you guys just to notice, this is more for later on in the story, the off one is kind of split into inner kingdoms, which are inside this mountain range, and the outer kingdoms. And to get from the outer kingdoms to the inner kingdoms, you often have to go through narrow mountain passes or these places where gates have been set up for the pe defensive purposes for the interior of Ulfwan, really to kind of protect it, to make it a last stand kind of territory. And one of the gates in particular that will play an important part in the later stories of Malekith and Marathi is the Phoenix Gate, uh, marked here on the map. Now, with the Phoenix King setting up court in Nagarif, he, being at this constant state of war, starts to really prioritize strength of arms. And warriors who are hardened, who are willing to fight chaos nonstop, who kind of indulge in war, 
and enjoy it and have taken a liking to this constant state of sort of blood and slaughter and murder and it starts to take on a very dark presence not only are they indulging in this but they begin to grow cruel in their warlike escapades unlike they'd been previously and because death might come for any elf fighting in the armies at any day they tend to indulge in all the pleasures of the earth while they're alive so you never know if tomorrow's going to be the day you die so let's all screw each other's brains out and cut each other and self-harm and do whatever brings us any iota of pleasure tonight and then tomorrow we'll go back to war. So it really takes on this kind of bad reputation amongst the other elven provinces, but they are essentially representing the vast bulk of the strength of arms of the elven army and so are respected in that light, but you know, there's kind of that disapproving look behind the scenes that the other elves will give each other about what's going on here at Nagara. During this time, as the years roll on, Marathi has an increasing influence on the court. It's very much more present that she's running large parts of the kingdom through an area and, and people just kind of whisper amongst themselves that perhaps he's bewitched by her or no one's really sure how she's exerting so much power on the once so prominent Anarian. And things have gotten so bad at this court and with Marathi taking over so many of the courtly decisions that his old friend Kalidor the Dragon Tamer, this powerful mage friend of his who'd stuck with him since day one, eventually kind of separates himself and it's like, mate, I think I'm gonna go try my own thing to solve this chaos problem. I think you've really lost your way. I don't think this is really the way that things should be. And Anarian, being quite prideful, sees this as a kind of betrayal. Well, the two kind of part ways, and rather than fighting together as they had done for all these years, find their own ways of fighting chaos and Kalidor begins working on this solution he's had for a time to set up this vortex, which will essentially drain away most of the chaos magic from the Warhammer world, effectively making it so that the vast amount of demons that currently exist in the Warhammer world can no longer manifest in the world, in our world, and have to go back to their own realm because there's just not enough chaos energy present. Around this time, when Kalidor is working on this vortex concept, a host the size of which has never been seen before of chaos marches on Ulfwan. Now, this presents Anarian with a choice. He can either stay and defend the kingdoms as he's done from his northern base in Nagareth, or he can go and help his friend for this last ditch effort that may finally offer a solution to chaos in the world forever. So it's either defend his own kingdom or go and try and find the final solution for his once friend who had betrayed him, essentially who was in his mind a traitor. And Anarian, perhaps salvaging the last vestiges of sense and righteousness from his soul that had perhaps been suppressed by the sword of Cain, the constant battling, the presence of this highly suspicious Marathi wife. But he manages to fight off all those influences, goes against the wishes of his new wife, and goes to help his mate Kalidor. And arriving at Kalidor, he sees a huge number of the hosts have already arrived at this island, which is essentially the Isle of the Dead, as you'll see in the middle of the Inner Sea. As you'll see in the middle of the Inner Sea on this map of Ulfwan. And upon arriving at the Isle of Dead, he gets his forces to engage, essentially buy time. He knows it's not a battle he can win, but he can buy time for Kalidor, and that's all that Kalidor needs to hopefully make his plan work. But upon arriving, his army engages the forces of Chaos, but there are some forces there that his army can't hope to stand against, and those arrive in the guise of four greater demons, who are essentially rushing for Kalidor to try and kill him to stop this vortex concept from going off at all. Seeing these greater demons, Anarion and his trusted dragon Indrognir swooped down and began to engage them all in battle. It's said that Anarion's army and himself fought like gods reborn that day in holding off the innumerable hordes of chaos. Through a fierce battle, the likes of which had never been witnessed by gods nor men, Anarion and his trusted dragon managed to defeat all four of the Chaos Demons and buy Kalidor enough time to complete his ritual. In so doing, Kalidor Dragon Tamer, the most famed of the Elven Mages, froze himself and his fellow mages in time as the Vortex began to take effect. And almost instantaneously, the forces of Chaos began to dissipate and disappear 
back into their own realm. However, the price of battle was high. Anarion and his dragon had been fatally wounded. With his last vestiges of strength, Anarion and his dragon flew back to the shrine of Cain, and Anarion placed the sword of Cain back in the shrine, and that was the last anyone saw of Anarion the Defender. With the disappearance and presumed death of Anarion, and in an effort to rebuild, the elves had to name a new phoenix king to their throne. The obvious choice was Malekith. He had great martial skill, knowledge, diplomatic prowess, and would make a suiting heir to Anarion himself. The other princes of the kingdom, however, had a different idea, and the, the position of the phoenix king is one that's elected by the fellow princes, not one that's inherited. So they, thinking that Malekith might suffer from the same kind of penchant for violence that led the province of Nagareth into kind of its dark era, didn't want to see that happen to the entirety of Ulfwan. And they, realizing that this might be more of an era of peace than of war, with the hordes of chaos seemingly mostly defeated, they wanted a different kind of leader, one that could rehabilitate the elves from a warlike race to the peaceful one they had once been. So rather than selecting Malekith, they chose a prince amongst them known as Belshanar. Now Marathi was livid with this, she was raging at this news, but Malekith himself seemed to take this in stride and indeed was the first to bend the knee to Belshanar, the new phoenix king. Following this, everyone kind of suspected that everything was cool. Malekith was alright with the decision. And, uh, you know, you never know. He might be the next Phoenix King. They, they, that's always a possibility. So, life then began to develop some kind of normalcy. The Elves became an increasingly peaceful people. They began to rebuild their demolished homeland. And even after a time, they began to expand outwards. They began to set up colonies in what we now call the Old World. And Malekith was keen to explore these new territories. He, in fact, moved himself from his princedom, Nagarif. He kind of went traveling. He went to Tor Alessi, which we perhaps know better as the city of Longui in Bretonia. There, he met and married a beautiful elven damsel known as Alisara. Now, Alisara was a priestess of Lilith the elven goddess of dreams, and as we may know her now, as the Lady of the Lake, who has ensnared Bretonia to protect her interests. In this new land, Malekith, who did like to practice his martial skill and kill a thing or two from time to time, took to the land because there, in the old world, he found orcs and the remnants of the Chaos armies who would give him a good battle from time to time. He continued his journeys eastwards, eventually encountering the dwarves, who themselves were expanding westward at this time, Together, side by side with the High King of the Elves, Snorri Whitebeard, they fought many battles, and indeed, Malekith's friendship with Snorri became the foundation of a long-lasting friendship between the Elves and the Dwarves themselves. So much so that Belshinar, the Phoenix King himself, came over to present gifts of friendship to Snorri Whitebeard, including some of the most expensive wine the Elves have ever produced, which Snorri gratefully chinned a barrel of in one go, as a show of respect, but one the elves took it with a little bit of shock. To find out a bit more about Snorri Whitebeard, uh, do check the top right hand corner for my Grombrindal lore video, or check the description if you don't see it there. When Belshinar came over and they had a big feast representing their friendship with, with the elves and the dwarves, Belshinar named Malekith the ambassador of the elves and that he should live in Karazakarak and just, you know, represent the elves and go to war with Snorri and just continue their long-lasting friendship between the two peoples. The two of them, Malekith and Snorri, continued their, their adventures and indeed, eventually, all age caught up with Snorri. On his deathbed, Malekith was indeed there, present as one of his best friends, and he made Malekith swear that the friendship between the elves and the dwarves would be one that would last forever. Malekith agreed to Snorri's request and soon thereafter Snorri passed from this world. After the death of his friend, Malekith kind of left the service of the dwarves and began traveling again. He sort of went back to Ulfwan, he went looking for a while for his father's armor, he went to look at the Shrine of Cain which seemed to transfix him due to the curse that Aneron had put on his bloodline, they'd always have this lusting for the Sword of Cain but he did not take it up. He journeyed far to the east and made war with the despotic realms of men in that direction. He traveled to the frozen north, 
where he encountered a dead city, and in it he found an um, item of some magical significance known as the Iron Circlet. Now, when he placed this Iron Circlet on his head, he became changed. He became overcome with this sudden curiosity for the dark arts of magic and renewed his interest in this subject, devoting almost every waking moment to its study. And after some time, Malekith returned to Toralesi to his wife, and his wife was delighted with his return. However, something seemed changed about her husband. With a kind of minor gift of foresight that she had, what once been the shining silver line of his destiny, she was now hidden from her and she had no idea what lay in store for Malekith. This worried her greatly and gave her many restless nights. And indeed, in a dream, as Lilith was prone to do, her goddess gave Alisara a vision. And upon receiving this vision, the next morning, Malekith woke up to find his wife missing. He searched for her for a time, but the Iron Circle had, had such an effect on his mental priorities that eventually he just gave up completely, didn't, wasn't too bothered about it. After a, a remarkably short amount of time of your wife goes missing, and just started delving back into his studies of the dark magics. And it said his memory of Alisara was said to kind of slowly fade from his mind and drown away by the dark waters of the influence of the Iron Circlet. Back home in Ulfwan, however, all was not well. Belshanar, the Phoenix King, was met with a number of rising cults that had seemed to spring up all over Ulfwan. Some devoted to the pleasures of the flesh, some devoted to the worship of Cain, and obviously of what he represents, of murder and the like. And these cults had begun to ensnare a number of increasingly influential individuals. And a few of the princes had fallen into some of these cults themselves. And these princes were encouraged to kind of see Belshinar as a inadequate Phoenix King with a flaws and not really suited for the role and whisperings of overthrowing him had began to emerge from these cults and increasingly war amongst the elves seemed a likely outcome. When Malekith returned to Elfwan, however, the Phoenix King saw this as potentially beneficial. As Malekith had been away, he wasn't maybe he probably wasn't under the influence of many of these cults, and so he could thus investigate and exterminate them. So the Phoenix King had tasked Malekith with riping out all of these cults and bringing the realm back under control. Malekith delved into this duty, rounding up hundreds if not thousands of cult members and seeing them executed, winning victory over victory over these members of these cults. However, unbeknownst to the Phoenix King, the person behind all these cults to begin with was none other than Malekith's mother, Marathi. And Malekith was not wiping out cult members, but any potential opposition to his own rule. After a number of years of wiping out all of these potential obstacles to his path to power, Malekith beseeched the Phoenix King to call an assembly of the princes, where they all gathered at the shrine of Assyrian. Having arrived at the shrine, Malekith had secretly moved his entire army of Nagarith warriors to positions around the temple in order to stage a coup. He promptly accused the Phoenix King of being the leader of the cults, whereby the Phoenix King, quite handily, managed to fall over poisoned. Malekith claimed that he'd poisoned himself in shame at the discovery of his leadership of the cult. A number of the princes present did not agree and called Malekith a traitor. Malekith had his agents come into the temple and promptly wipe these princes out. This would be known as the slaughter at the Temple of Assyrian. He then decided to take the mantle of the Phoenix King and walked through the fires of Assyrian. Unlike Anarian and Belshanar, the fires burnt Malekith, penetrated his flesh and left him in writhing agony. With his last ounce of strength, he managed to throw himself clear of the fires being a charred wretch of the man he used to be. In horror, his warriors grabbed him and retreated back north. With grievous injuries to Malekith, Murafi took control of the armies of Nagarith, and they retreated to their strongholds in the north. They also called upon all their allies, so they had managed to infiltrate the families of Tyrannoch and Illyrian, and called them to their side, which they promptly answered. They also called the Mages of Safri, renowned for the number of mages this area produced, they had managed to kind of split the population, and with civil war now seemingly inevitable, the mages of Safari took up arms against one another. Eventually, the mages who did not agree with Malekith's attempted rise to the Phoenix throne won out, and those who had lost 
retreated back to the lands of Nagareth to join with Malekith and Marathi. They'd also managed to englamour or enchant or just simply convince a famous smith known as Hote, who was a priest of Vol, to join their forces. And he, with the help of these renegade mages, managed to forge a suit of armour which they welded onto Malachis' flesh to help strengthen and heal him. And in this moment, it said the Prince of Nagareth had died and born was Malachith, the Witch King. With his new suit of magically endowed armor, Malachith and his mother, Marathi, began to wage war against the rest of Ulfwan. If he could not do a peaceful coup, war was the only option left to him. The remaining princes who had fought against Malachith's attempt to take the Phoenix throne elected a new Phoenix king of their own, Imric of Kalador, and Imric proceeded to rally all the forces who were against Malachith and a huge civil war amongst the elves broke out. However, Malekith was a renowned warrior and canny general. It said wherever the Witch King went, victory followed. Imric was forced into a defensive tactic of guerrilla warfare, of hit and run. This conflict lasted for 25 years until they finally met on the fields of Malador. Now, from the beginning, Malekith's forces seem to have had the advantage of numbers, of preparation. They'd been planning this action for a long time. So in this battle, Malekith had the strength of numbers, seemingly the strength of arms, and he came upon Imric on the fields of Malador. Imric himself, being a martially skilled fighter, managed to slay Malekith's black dragon, Saluk, and Malekith landed amongst the Phoenix Guard, some of the most elite of Ulfwan's warriors. He did manage to cut his way free from them, but was forced to flee the battle, and seeing his mighty dragon fall, the forces of Malekith wavered and were indeed ridden down and defeated that day. As the jeers of victory went up from the United Elves of Ulfwan underneath the banner of Imric, their new Phoenix King, Malekith was enraged. And as one final act of vengeance, he decided, if I can't rule Ulfwan, I will doom the world. And he set about trying to unbind the vortex that Kalidor, the dragon tamer, had put into place to essentially eliminate the armies of Chaos from taking over the world. Malkith was like, I'm going to undo this vortex. I'm going to have Chaos burn the world. If I can't have it, no one can take that world in a very angsty, emo-like way that he does. It was essentially a magic war spanning over the entirety of Ulfwan. Malekith and his sorcerers were fighting to undo it. The sorcerers who were loyal to the Phoenix King were fighting. And indeed, as Malekith's sorcerers began to use some of the last of their strength, they were finally tilting the balance. The vortex was starting to unbind. But in unbinding the vortex, it freed Kalidor, the dragon tamer, and his ancient mages, who had been trapped in time, essentially, in the vortex. Realizing what was going on, they lent their strength to that of wizards loyal to the Phoenix King and managed to reseal the vortex. Now, the magical backlash of the sheer amount of magical energy that was being used to unbind and rebind this vortex had a catastrophic effect on the geography of Alfwan itself. It said the mountains trembled and the sea began to undulate wildly around the island. Essentially, a thousand foot tidal wave swept over the northern territories of Alfwan, mostly affecting the lands of Nagarif itself, the, the princedom of Malakif, completely destroying it in this tidal wave. The mages of Malekith's territories, however, had managed to save some strength. They put up some protective shields around some of the main fortresses within Malekith's kingdom, if you will. And these broke away with the force of the tidal waves itself, creating now what is known as the Black Arcs of the Dark Elves, essentially these floating fortresses. Beaten, distraught, having most of his armies and forces wiped out by this tidal wave that have ripped apart his kingdom, Malekith ordered those loyal to him and those who essentially had no choice but to be loyal to him for fear of be facing punishment at the hands of their elven brothers, took off, left off one with their floating fortresses, and it said they headed west to the land of the setting sun, looking to find solace in the darkness that that presented to them. 
Eventually, around the year negative 2723 of the Imperial calendar, so around 5,000 years before under current Total War Warhammer timeline, forces of what would become known as the Dark Elves settled in the lands of Nagaroth. And indeed, Malekith's Black Ark nestled into the cliffside, and he founded the capital city of Nagaroth, which would become known as Nagarond, which had nestled itself in hillsides which were rich in iron and rock. And from here, he decided to rebuild a kingdom and rebuild his forces. However, what the Dark Elves were sorely short of was labor. They needed labor to build this new kingdom of theirs, and so they took to taking slaves. Now, finding Ulfwan a bit of a challenge and knowing any respectable high elf would sooner die in battle than allow themselves to be taken as a slave, Malekith had to look elsewhere for his workforce. So he looked to the lands of the east and the primitive tribes of man mainly. And soon the Dark Elves began to take vast numbers of slaves to help build their new kingdom, their new fortresses, their new cities. And Nagaron became something of a pirate bay, if you will, with them setting sail out, pillaging any ships they came across, taking slaves, taking riches. And this very much became part of the Dark Elf lifestyle. After some time, Malekith's forces had begun to rebuild and re-strengthen themselves. And Malekith, always having his eyes set on the Phoenix throne, launched a new offensive against the Phoenix King. He made landfall on his old territory of Nagarith. He rebuilt his old city of Anlek as a base of foundations and from there he started to wage war against the High Elves yet again. Now this conflict I believe is said to have lasted about 2,000 years with their fight going back and forth, neither one side or the other gaining the upper hand. But eventually, Imric, who'd become known as Kalador, the Phoenix King at this point, actually won out and managed to drive Malekith from his lands once again. However, it did not come without a price, this victory. And with the Phoenix King being upon a ship at one point, Malekith used his all his dark magics with the help of his mother, and they set a huge storm upon this fleet that the Phoenix King was traveling in. They managed to isolate his ship and promptly set their own ships against him. Once they'd managed to corner the Phoenix King, knowing what they'd planned to do, he threw himself into the sea in full plate armor and promptly drowned, without giving Malekith the pleasure of torturing him for many centuries to come. And again, Malekith was forced to retreat and to rebuild his fortresses. So in this new kingdom of Nagaroth that Malekith had built, pleasure cults started to spring up all over the place, worship of the Lord of Murder, Cain, became rife within their societies, and Malekith, looking to kind of get political hay out of this, declared himself the living avatar of Cain. However, in reality, that, that wasn't really the case. He just sort of gave himself that title, hoping to inspire the kind of religious fervor that had been springing up in his society and direct it towards himself. So with the founding of Nagron, Malekith took over this city and gave his mother control of the Tower of Grond, where she made her base, very close by, as you can see. Now, having twice now tried to take the Phoenix Throne, resulting in huge amounts of losses of the elves, Malekith feared what might become of the elves and the dwarves ever teaming up to go against him. Now, in their one could call foolish pride, the what were now the High Elves had never told the dwarves that there'd been a war on Ulfwan and that the factions of the elves had split. They'd never let what the, all elves consider anyone else to be lesser than themselves, so they never let a lesser species know that they were having political trouble. Fearing that this may eventually change, Malekith used this knowledge to his advantage for now, and he sent a contingent of his dark riders to the old world to begin to ransack and pillage dwarven settlements. Now these were dwarven settlements that Malekith had learnt of during his time with Snorri Whitebeard. And completely breaking the vow he'd made to Snorri on his deathbed, Malekith ordered his Dark Riders to start slaughtering these dwarves indiscriminately. Now the dwarves couldn't let this lie. They had no idea why the elves were attacking. As far as they were concerned, elves were elves. There was no distinction. So they sent word to the Phoenix King, and the Phoenix King kind of ignored them. They eventually sent messengers, and the Phoenix King at this point, who was a chap called Kalador II, and became to be known as an incompetent Phoenix King, ignored the pleas of dwarves, and then when they sent, and when the dwarves eventually sent messengers to Ulfwan itself, 
he had them shaved and sent back, which is really the most offensive thing one could ever imagine doing to a dwarf, and this prompted what would become known as the War of Vengeance or the War of the Beard, depending on which side of the conflict you stood on. So for centuries, the War of the Beard raged on. The dwarves fought the High Elves off the territories of what would become known as the Old World. Their final stand was at Toralesi, which you guys that I mentioned earlier may know as Longui. And there the dwarves fought the High Elves off the territories of the Old World altogether, save for those who took refuge in Athol Loren, but they severed their links to the Phoenix Throne anyway, so they were an independent party at this point. Looking to take advantage of this war, Malekith again he strode forth to attack Ofwen, and he did it at full strength. All the Black Arcs that had nestled themselves in Nagaroth were promptly severed from their moorings and set to the sea once more. And with a vast horde of warriors and slaves at his beck and call, he sailed southeast back to Ulfwan in another attempt to claim the Phoenix Throne. On his journey across the ocean, he learned of the death of the incompetent Phoenix King Kalidor II. Now, this was actually bad news to Malekith, because although he always rejoiced in the death of a Phoenix King, Kalidor's incompetence looked like it was actually going to be of huge benefit in the war to come. But instead, Kalidor had died, which meant a competent Phoenix King might be put in his place, which would make things a bit more difficult for Malekith. The new Phoenix King was called Caradriel, and he devised a new system to hold back the forces of the Dark Elves, who again had made their base in Malekith's old princedom, of Nagareth, or as the region had become known since to many of the High Elves as the Shadowlands. And as you know, to get to the Shadowlands, to the interior of Alfwan, you have to go through these numerous mountain passes, as I mentioned earlier. Now, the Phoenix King knew this, and so decided to sort of stand his ground at the mountain passes. And the most prominent of these, between Nagareth and the interior of Ulfwan, was going through the Griffin Gate. So the Phoenix King set up a system whereby he would rotate his troops in and out of the Griffin Gate garrison to keep them fresh, to keep them fighting, and doing this he managed to hold off the forces of the Dark Elves. Malekith did not have this option to keep his troops fresh, and so his troops began to get demoralized and tired and, and start to lose numbers due to the freshness of the High Elf troops. What the Dwarven Wars had actually provided the Phoenix King with, although him not necessarily being a great warrior himself, it had provided him with a number of fantastic generals who'd essentially been having this war in the Old World for centuries, and so were battle-hardened and very experienced. Chief amongst these was a general known as Teflis. Eventually, this new general Teflis gathered up a host and led it to the Griffin Gate itself. He managed to break the Dark Elf siege of the gate, but in retaliation, Malekith led an equally large force to attempt to re-establish the siege on the Griffin Gate. And this back and forth of attack and counter-attack really set the entire tone of this war for centuries to come. Now, Caradriel, the Phoenix King, reigned for six centuries while this war was ongoing. And with the just time passing, Caradriel just died of old age, as elves can do after many thousands of years. And Teflis became the new Phoenix King. And indeed, Teflis's cunning and ability at battle reminded Malakir very much of Kalidor I, or Imric of Kalidor, as you may remember him from early in the stories, who had initially driven Malakir off of Ulfwan. And with Teflis in charge, not only was he a better overall commander in terms of the Phoenix King role, but he also concentrated on the discipline and coordination of his army, which made them a much more effective fighting force. And eventually, with this renewed fighting force, the High Elves managed to drive Malekith yet again off of Alfwan, and he sort of held out a little bit of the beachhead on the Blighted Isle, which is just north of Alfwan itself, and colossal battle took place there, turning the sea red with blood, sea creatures were thrashing in the waves, but eventually the Dark Elves were driven from the Blighted Isle as well. However, Teflis was not going to live to enjoy this victory. Upon landing on the Blighted Isle, he'd made his way to the Shrine of Cain. And all that's really known about what happened is eventually his body was discovered therein. Now, no one knows whether he tried to reach for the Sword of Cain and was struck down by Cain himself, 
or by Malekith's assassins, or by his own guard fearing that if he drew the Sword of Cain, he would bring about an Age of Darkness for the Elves themselves, but this still lies as a bit of an open mystery as to what befell the Phoenix King, Teclis. After these centuries of war, the High Elves no longer had an appetite for battle. They just wanted to go back to living peacefully and being left alone, and Malekith's forces had essentially been completely annihilated. This brings us to around the year negative 692 of the Imperial Calendar, about 2,200 years before the current Total War Warhammer timeline. So Malekith retreats back home to Nagaroth to lick his wounds yet again. Malekith returned to Nagaroth and began to focus on his defences. It would take him time to build up his army's strength once again. As an alternative tactic, Morify proposed a different strategy to trying to take Ulfwan, as Force of Arms seemed to have failed them twice now. So Marathi begins to remind Malekith of the success of the Cults of Pleasure, and how Elves can often be drawn to them. So she suggests that you heap luxuries and praise on those most dedicated to Cain and to the darker gods of the Elven Pantheon, and send them forth to Ulfwan as secret agents, essentially, who have been trained by the Assassins of Cain, which are a sect that exists in Nagaroth now. So he agrees with this, and he sends forward a bunch of Dark Elves who reintegrate themselves into Ulfwan society as smiths, as merchants, as all kinds of things, and they're essentially sleeper agents who have been trained by the assassins of Cain to strike when the time is right, to undermine elven politics, and to recruit other people into the cults of pleasure that they are going there to found, essentially. At this point in elven society, with the death of Teclis, a new Phoenix King was crowned, and that his name was Belkahadris. And as time passed, Belkahadris passed the Phoenix throne on to Aethys. And Aethys goes on to be the next Phoenix King. And it's during the reigns of these two Phoenix Kings that these cults begin to grow, and again begin to gain traction within elven society. However, the peace and kind of malaise that set over the Elves of Ulfwan as far as war and conflict is concerned is beginning to affect Malekith as well, and he's overcome with this kind of sense of ennui. Without this constant state of warfare, he finds himself withdrawing from Dark Elf society and really kind of just keeping himself to himself. If there's nothing to challenge him, he kind of begins to fade in terms of his hatred and his anger for the High Elves, and just sort of gets about his own thing in his own day and removes himself from the running of the country and for plotting again to take over the Phoenix throne. Now, Morathi, his mother, is quite angry about this. She likes her boy fired up, plotting murder and carnage and war and savagery, and won't be happy until he sits on the Phoenix throne. So she tries to think of ways to knock him out of this. One of her ideas is to sacrifice to Cain daily, so her kind of murders pick up the rate to try and get Cain to reinvigorate her son. This doesn't really work. So she goes to one of the other cities of Nagaroth and incites a rebellion. Now Malekith gets out, gets up on his new black dragon and quickly quells this rebellion in a horrid, merciless-like way. But this is only a temporary reprieve from his general kind of lackadaisical nature that seems to have taken over him at this point. So this doesn't seem to work and she doesn't really know what to do. She's kind of at her wit's end. At this point, messengers from Athel Lauren have arrived and it transpires that Alessara, Malekith's long-lost wife and sister to Ariel, who is now Queen of the Wood Elves, has reached out and said she wants to come home and she's sorry for everything that's happened. And Malekith gets this news and tries to hide it with no luck from his mother, who has spies all over his court. And his mother is like, no, she might actually, with the state of mind he is in now, she might actually convince him to lay down arms and maybe even reunify the elven people and give up his quest for the phoenix throne. So she decides we can't have this. However, if she was to act openly against Alisara, she's sure that her son would kill her. So she comes up with a plan and she disguises herself and goes to Ulfwan and it's described as in glamours, but essentially like sexes up this prince and enchants him with her magic and her hot body and it convinces this prince that this kind of army who sent to escort Alisara to see Malekith 
is really an army going to pledge themselves to the Dark Elves. And this High Elf Prince is like, oh no, we can't have that. He himself having fallen on some dark times for some previously disgraceful behavior in amongst the princes of Ulfwan. So in a bid to kind of rebuild his good name, he sets off with an army and having his eyes tricked by Marathi into thinking that these are all Dark Elves and all their Dark Elf regalia and that's about slaughtering them. And it's not until he finally corners Alisara, who he sees as the big queen of this Dark Elf army. He begins to raise his spear above his head before thrusting it into her. Alisara, having sort of being a good a sorceress in her own right, senses Marathi's magic and begins to try and dispel it. And she begins to do the enchantment, but she's too late and the spear pierces through her. And with her last gasp of breath, she whispers the last words. And as her blood trickles down the spear onto the hands of Valador, his eyes are opened. And he sees all the carnage he's brought upon his wood elf brethren. And he is devastated. And he goes and he flings himself off the nearest cliff because they are fighting on the shores of Bretonia. His soldiers promptly return home, not really understanding what occurred at all. And they're just kind of amused by the whole thing and kind of try to forget about it, although they think they've done something horrendously wrong. And so Alisar is dead, this threat to Marathi of being able to quench the fires of hatred that burn within Malekith has been dealt with. But just due to the nature of communication in the old world, it takes weeks for Malekith to learn of this. And even when the court of Malakir finds out, no one has the balls to tell him. So days and days go by once they've actually heard the news and everyone knows that probably the first person to tell him will die. At that point, Marathi arrives from her sort of travels, shall we say, and hiding her glee, reports the news that has been received from the old world, that his wife is dead. Enraged that the love of his life, who he happened to have forgotten about really for the last few millennia, had been killed, Malekith, having reignited the kind of furnace of hatred within him with the death of his wife, Alisara, summoned his war council to him and promptly had them all murdered. He felt that in his kind of withdrawal from the council and the sort of running of the country that these guys had all tried to take over and that his armies weren't yet at full strength because they'd been having power games in an attempt to take over the vacuum of power Malekith had left behind. And so depleted all of their forces fighting amongst one another, which Malekith couldn't abide and this is why he wasn't at full strength. And thus, he triggered the strategy his mother had suggested of the cults, and he put them into full effect. Aethys, the new Phoenix King, who Malekith would no doubt face in this new offensive, had become kind of a weak king. The arts really did very well under him in terms of poetry and literature and artistic endeavor. But as a warrior race, the elves had really fallen away. They hadn't really kept up their martial skills. Their army had become a shadow of what it once was and their new phoenix king had put little value in building up the armed forces at all. So Malekith launched this offensive, they go south yet again, the cults rise up and start to attack key targets in Ulfwan to try and ease the way for Malekith to arrive, but unbeknownst to Malekith, the previous phoenix king, Bel Kahadris, had founded a tower of Hoeth, and from this tower, a new type of warrior was being trained, and these new warriors were the sword masters of Hoeth, and they'd been fighting a secret war against these cults of excess for all these years. And in fact, the cults had been a fraction of what they could have possibly been, thanks to the effort of these sword masters. However, the cults had done their job, and in fact, a cultist that by the name of Girafor had in fact managed to infiltrate so high up in High Elf society that he was the chancellor to the Phoenix King. And indeed, he choked the Phoenix King to death, and so he killed the Phoenix King. Now, why Malekith would want an incompetent Phoenix King dead isn't 100% clear, but the Phoenix King is dead, and the idea is that it sends the rest of Ulfwan into disarray. This is all actions that Malekith engineers before he sets off with his army to the shores of Ulfwan itself. So after some time, Malekith actually discovers that his mother was responsible for the death of Alisara, and he imprisons her for a year, in his deepest, darkest dungeon. Now, after this year, he's been pondering what to do about his mother, whether he should kill her, what the punishment should be, 
but he acknowledges that the death of Alessaro did rekindle the flames of hatred within himself and made him a stronger leader. So after a year, he, he brings his mother back into the court and says, okay, mother, I'm going to let you go. Once he'd forgiven her, it was a good thing he didn't see her face as she was leaving his hole, for a knowing smile crept over it, and had he seen it, he surely would have struck her down there and then. Murphy was not free and clear, however. The Wood Elves were still out looking for vengeance. Alisar was, after all, the sister of the Queen of the Wood Elves, Ariel, who had since become the living embodiment of the elven goddess Isha, and she was married to the living avatar of the elven goddess Kurnos, in the form of Orion. So the Wood Elves were on the warpath for those responsible for killing the Queen of the Wood Elves' sister. They had gone to Ulfwan initially and had discovered that Marathi was the one behind it. So using the ancient system of the world roots, they secretly made their way up through Nagaroth and started to siege and attack Marathi's fortress. They eventually breached it and Orion was on the verge of running through Marathi with a spear but Marathi could taste the dark magic that Ariel seemed to be using and so offered Ariel a deal to teach her more of the dark arts for Marathi could tell she was but an amateur in this area of magic. Almost to her surprise, Ariel agreed with Marathi's deal and they allowed her to live, provided she teach Ariel the secrets of the darker side of magic. So having had the cults wipe out the previous Phoenix King, the new Phoenix King, Morvael, who would become known as Morvael the Impetuous, launched a war fleet against the Dark Elves in retaliation. Now not knowing the Dark Elves at this point, having dealt with the issues of his warring dreadlords and sort of put everyone back under his authoritative banner and regrown the dark elf armies the fleet of the high elves encountered a dark elf army at full strength and were promptly slaughtered this left off one essentially with no real standing army with which to resist the cultists had done their work and weakened a number of institutions around off one itself and so malekith thought the time is nigh and he moved to strike at the heart of Ulfwan itself. Yet again, he stuck with the tactic of going back to his boyhood home of Nagareth and setting up his army there, rebuilding yet again his hometown of Anlek with the help of slaves. You may be noticing a slight sense of repetition here, but this is, this is the story of Malekith and how it goes. All the High Elves really had to counter him at this point were civilian militia levies, who were poorly trained, not professional warriors, and this was all the arms they could really muster. However, despite this, these levies proved to be brave souls really just trying to fight for survival, and they managed to again hold the Dark Elf armies at the Griffin Gate. Malekith and his mother's dark magic were kind of reaching out and trying to get every advantage they could. They started to poison the mind of the Phoenix King with nightmarish dreams, night upon night, to bring him to despair. And eventually, Morvael managed to resist most of this stuff, but he decided to spend what was left of the treasury of the High Elves on rebuilding a naval fleet. And this tactic seemed to slightly work. What they managed to do was to actually cut off the supply lines of the Dark Elves to reinforce their army, which was already on Ulfwan, and really started to affect the strength with which they could advance. And this resulted in this conflict stretching out for a number of years, yet again. This is an edit that needs to go in earlier, but it's a repetition. Bear it, make sure we take it out from before. So the Witch King eventually lost patience and marched on the Griffin Gate itself, swept the defenders from the ramparts, and charged in. His soldiers, however, began to scatter. They got a bit distracted with the rape, murder, and torture of all these new High Elves they just captured. Now, because of this, they kind of scattered and they lost their momentum going forward. Now, a new champion of Calador had arisen in these intervening years between the last war, named Menthius of Calador, and he reached the Griffin Gates with reinforcements because the High Elves had wasted so much time murdering, raping, and torturing all their new captives. And these reinforcements eventually managed to drive the Dark Elves back into the Shadowlands. And again, they were locked in a conflict that would last decades, going back and forth, no one really gaining an upper hand. And this conflict seems to last over three centuries. Now, in these three centuries, the armies that had been civilian levies essentially all became hardened warriors over the years. 
and their martial skill began to match that of the Dark Elves themselves. And with their supply lines being constantly harangued and harassed and compromised, the Dark Elves never managed really to gain the upper hand. And eventually in a final battle in the Shadowlands, this new champion of Kalidor, Mentheus, was riding and faced Malekith in battle. Malekith managed to kill Mentheus, but Mentheus's dragon, Nightfang, went absolutely berserk at the death of its master. It tore apart Analek, the capital of the Shadowlands that Malekith was using as his beachhead, and it tore apart its walls, it killed hundreds if not thousands of Dark Elves, and it was eventually brought down. But the damage it had done to the army and to the structure itself forced the Dark Elves to retreat back from their fortress, and indeed pull back from Ulf one yet again. On his return to Nagaroth, Malekith had all his admirals executed for their failure to break the blockade of the High Elves to get a constant and steady supply line going through and reinforcing his armies. He blamed them for this failure. But he did take solace in the fact that Morvael had finally succumbed to the amount of pressure and depression caused by Malekith and Morathi's dreams being implanted into his head. The Phoenix King was driven to such despair that he in fact killed himself before the war had concluded by throwing himself into the fires of Assyrian. This made the seventh Phoenix King he'd seen dead in his lifetime as he was effectively immortal now and he kind of took a little bit of delight in that fact and he sort of took solace in the idea that eventually after all these Phoenix Kings are dead, he will be able to take his place on the Phoenix throne. Again, due to his immense rage, no one wanted to approach Malekith during this time, and indeed it was many weeks before any dared, and when they was, it was Morathi, his mother, to lend him some counsel yet again. Having unfortunately failed yet again to take the Phoenix throne, Malekith decided for a bit of a change in tact, a change, a change in strategy, if you will, of the Dark Elf progression, and he kind of just says like, all right guys there's some new powers who have popped up around the world these humans have seemed to be doing okay in the old world there seems to be some stuff going on there let's go pillage and pilfer everything that's going on over there and make ourselves wealthy and build our power base back up this kicks off something known as the age of glorious torment and all of the fleets of Nagaroth sail out and start pillaging the old world robbing, burning ports, and of course the first sort of line of attack on this one is Bretonnia unfortunately seems to take the brunt of many of these attacks. There is a famous incident in which the Duke Bastintal of Longuy returned from the Crusades only to find his ancestral castle stripped of everything valuable and every chamber had old congealed blood reaching to the height of one's knees. His household, his family, his servants had been dismembered and their body parts hung from the chandeliers above. This wrath extended as far south as Tilia with Tilian dukes hoping to pay off these dark elf marauders with offerings of gold. However, these offerings of gold were accepted but then the Dark Elves just raided and burned the cities anyway. In terms of their spy networks, the Dark Elves work to undermine any attempt of Ulf One to reach out and befriend the other civilizations of the world, looking to isolate Ulf One and limit its access to allies in any potential future conflicts. So they would shadow the High Elf diplomats as they went around the world, keeping tabs on what they were doing, paying off the other civilizations not to deal with the High Elves, all kinds of nefarious and dastardly means to limit the influence of high elf culture. And two centuries of this kind of pillaging on one side and spying and undermining the foreign policy of Ulfwan on the other just kind of kept going and that's how Malakif really kept tabs on Ulfwan itself. By this time a new phoenix king had risen to the throne known by the name of Finnebar. And Finnebar had had a lot of success in uniting the Elven people despite the spies and the dastardly tactics and political backstabbing that Malekith had set in place. Finnebar had really held the, Elven pe the High Elf people together and made them strong. After a while, Malekith was like, alright, screw this, this spy stuff isn't working as well as I'd hoped. Let's go back to war. 
and he summoned his counselors and he summoned his mother Marathi and they planned yet another invasion of Ulfwan. As they were preparing for this invasion however, a huge Norsken army came out of the Chaos Waste looking to plunder and pillage and destroy Nagarov. Now Malekith being the uh, sly git he is knew that his numbers may not be sufficient to take off one and it would be a fierce and competitive battle. But if he could add this Norsken horde to his own ranks, he might finally succeed in achieving his goal of taking the Phoenix throne. So in a kind of gesture of creepiness beyond measure in the Warhammer world, he essentially pimped out his mother. He sent Marathi up to the Norsken Waste to meet with the Norsken Raiders, offer them gold, slaves, and pleasures beyond imagining. It's said, however, when Marathi was ever in the presence of the Northmen, her flesh would crawl every moment she spent with them, but she hid her revulsion well, exposing the Norsemen to pleasures uh, so far unexperienced. So she really opened their eyes in a number of different ways, which is kind of gross and even now makes my skin crawl thinking about this story. This plan seemed to work. Marathi and her pleasurable ways seemed to win around all the Norsken leaders and they joined Malekith's cause, which in effect doubled the size of the Dark Elf fleet, sailed south once more to Ulfwan. Upon landing on Ulfwan, the Norsemen kind of busied themselves by raiding and ransacking the outer provinces of Ulfwan, and Malekith himself focused on breaking in into interior princedoms and, and taking them. He in fact managed to break through and started raiding and, and destroying the princedoms of Avalon. So with this new success, he'd broken through the Griffin Gate, which had stopped him on a couple of occasions before. He was in the interior. He felt that success could be his. He just had to kill the Ever queen and he was pretty sure that would be his last obstacle in his way so he sent his four best assassins to murder her but it transpires that off one had new heroes and principal among these he new heroes were the twins Tyrion and Teclis. Now Tyrion himself was hugely skilled in martial ability he was in fact the ancestor of Anarion the son the firstborn son of Anarion who was taken by Durfu and then returned to the elves after the war with chaos was over, grew up and he kind of had a quiet life, but his direct ancestors are these two boys. And Tyrion himself is said to possess such martial skill that he's believed to be a Narian reborn. The four assassins who were sent after the Everqueen were in fact dispatched by Tyrion and he rescued her, rode in and rode out, saving the Everqueen and taking her to safety. Despite this setback, Malekith's campaign was succeeding. Ulfwan was ablaze and he was winning victory after victory. However, the continued survival of the Everqueen gave him a reason to doubt. And having learned of these two twins, he realized that his army may not have what it takes to take these two guys down and the forces they may inspire. So in a desperate bid, because he was so close to his goal, he could practically taste it at this point, he did a deal with a demon. And he did a deal with the demon Nkari, and Inkari is the foremost greater demon servant of Slanesh, who we mentioned earlier is the god of forbidden pleasure and killing people while you sleep with them and bathing in their blood for funsies and all sorts of things like that. And with the help of the demon who was dispatched really to take care of these two twins, Malekith's armies went on. The demon helped him summon tentacles from the realm of chaos that would destroy the fortress of Tindalor. And the Witch King himself captured the High Commander of Kalidor, which had spawned so many heroes in its time who had thwarted his plans millennia ago. And he sacrificed the High Commander of Kalidor named Hecate in the most savage and cruel way possible in honor of Cain, the god of murder. Eventually, word reached Malekith that Inkari, this demon he'd done the deal with, had been banished somehow, and he'd lost that very powerful ally. Now this he took as a bad sign. He'd been so close so many times of taking the Phoenix throne that he began to doubt himself. He thought, okay, here we go again. I'm going to end up losing this bloody war because of some bloody upstart hero yet again. So he secretly, having kind of lost faith in this plan of attack, but still wanted to see if he could maybe pull it off with the help of the Norsken, he didn't want to lose any more of his own army should he lose and face any sort of counterattack from the High Elves. 
So he started selecting his most loyal generals and started sending them back to Nagarov. And he did this quietly so the Norskans never found out about it. And eventually he sent about half of his army back to Nagarov, hidden from his allies. But he was still winning, and it essentially came down to this decisive battle. And in this battle, he had half of his army, and about a quarter or more of that force was made up of warriors of chaos and the Norsemen. So he's on the battlefield, and he is facing off in this final confrontation against the remaining armies of Ulfwan, led by these two heroes and the Ever Queen herself, of course. Now, Malekith was trying to work a number of spells to give the benefit to his army, but he was being countered at every turn by Teclis. Malekith sent the generals of his army at the time, which was a chap called Urion Poison Blade, to go and fight Tyrion to, and end his life, essentially, and take care of that one. He'll take care of Teclis. Now, this battle was a bloody affair, and elf upon elf violence was just turning the ground beneath their feet into a quagmire of elven blood. Marathi herself, the mother of Malekith, was not present at this battle. She was watching from back home through her magic mirror. And to her astonishment, upon this battlefield, she spotted in true likeness none other but her long-lost husband, Anarion. Anarion, her husband, seemed to be fighting Urion Poisonblade, the general of her son's army. And watching this battle, enthralled by seeing her long-lost love brought back to life somehow, she saw Urion about to land a fatal strike against what, who she thought was Anarion, her husband. And she used her magics as much as she could muster from that distance away to deflect the blade off of the, its trajectory, allowing who she thought was an Aryan to deal the fatal blow to Urian Poison Blade. Now, it turns out this wasn't an Aryan, of course, but Tyrion, the new hero of the High Elves. But for her, having known an Aryan, he looked exactly like him. She couldn't tell the difference just from looking at him. She was convinced. He, the only difference was that he looked maybe less burdened than when she'd known him, less burdened with the loss of his family and with the constant warfare. But this was her husband, for as far as she was concerned. So she saved him. And with the loss of his general, it really came down to the magical duel between Malekith and Teclis, this new mage who had come, emerged to become leader of the elven mages. This duel lasted the entirety of the battle, and Teclis eventually managing to summon the power of the Moonstaff, which was his weapon conjured a curse on Malekith. Now, Malekith initially didn't know what this was. He thought it had maybe failed or had been dispelled by his armor or some such. But what the spell actually did was awaken the fire of Asurian, the elven god who ran the sort of the, the pillar of flame in the temple to crown the Phoenix King, and it reawakened that fire within Malekith's flesh causing it to burn him yet again from the inside. And this brought Malekith into terrible agony, and he couldn't escape this, and this seemed to be the end of Malekith. Except in some kind of brilliant moment of inspiration, thought to himself, through a blistering pain, he needed to disappear to the realms of chaos, where the flames couldn't reach him. So he whooped, popped himself back in, into the realms of chaos, and indeed, the flames did quell themselves there, because... The magic of Teclis couldn't reach him. But as far as the Dark Elves were concerned, they'd just lost their general, they'd just lost their Witch King, so they began to break, and they started to run. And the High Elves indeed started to ride them down. Now, having lost his general and the Witch King himself, the commander of Malekith's Black Guard, which is essentially his like the best of his, the best of the best of his troops, took command, started to fight a series of battles to allow the remnants of the Dark Elf army to at least retreat off of Ulfwan, because they were being harried and chased all the way from retreating to the Inner Kingdoms, back through the mountain passes, and back into the sea. And he'd successfully managed to do this, fighting a series of desperate, of increasingly more desperate battles. And eventually he did manage to get some survivors back to Nagarov. So essentially at this point, the Dark Elves have lost their Witch King. They've lost their generals, but Malekith had managed to preserve the vast majority of his loyal forces. But Malekith was gone. There was a huge power vacuum. Marathi, for a time, tried to deal with this as Dreadlords tried to claim the throne for themselves. She had a number of them imprisoned in their attempts to take over from Malekith and rule the Dark Elves. But eventually, she was put into confinement and kind of voluntarily surrendered herself. She managed to get a, me a message to uh, Karando, who's essentially like the most trusted soldier of Malekith. And he gets to the capital of Nagarond, and he says to all these dreadlords who are competing for power, 
Okay, you guys, let's see if we can't hash this out. I just led the remnants of the army back. I have some forces at my command. You know I had the trust of Malakif. Let's hash this out. So all of you come to meet me. You can't bring any forces and bring one weapon. That's the deal of this meeting. So they do that. And he essentially says, okay, you dreadlords, what's going to happen now is you're all going to fight. And whoever wins, whoever walks out of this room alive is the king of the Dark Elves and will rule in Malekith's stead until the day of his return. And they're all like, okay, this is a bit untowards. What gives you the authority? He's like, you got to do it now. And he got all his servants to shut them in at this great council chamber. And slyly, them thinking him unarmed and then not in the competition, they sort of set about killing each other as Kuran calmly walked over to his seat and reached for his weapon, which had been hidden in the shadows behind his chair. A few hours later, there was a massive banging on the door as Kuran em emerged as the only survivor of this conflict between the Dreadlords. He promptly freed Marathi and uh, with an agreement between the two of them, decided to rule until Malakith's return. So at this point, Marathi and Kuran are kind of ruling together and they've taken over and they're still trying to find ways of bringing Malakith back. They don't think he's dead. They know that he's gone to the realms of chaos, but it's, they have no idea really how to bring him back at this point. So Marathi is still concerned with what she'd seen in the battle. She'd seen her long lost husband, remember? And so she started a side project she tried to kind of figure out how her son where her son was but got distracted by hopefully reuniting with her husband if malakith couldn't be king then who better than anarian reborn to rule in his stead so at some point murify manages to engineer the situation where she kidnaps Tyrion, and she gets Tyrion, and she's like okay you're kind of you're almost exactly my husband i'm pretty sure but your mind has been warped with this loyalty to the phoenix king finnevar and your love for the disgusting whore the ever queen you shouldn't love her you should love me and Finnebar shouldn't be your phoenix king like you shouldn't be loyal to him you should be loyal only to me and to yourself so we'll try and get rid of those parts of your personality through my magical rituals now over the course of these magical rituals Essentially, Tyrion is freed by a traitor servant of Morify. Now, it's later revealed that this traitor servant might be in the service of Helbron. Now, who Helbron is, we'll get into a little bit later. But just remember that name, and that's who this servant was serving when she freed Tyrion. Because Helbron decided she, who was also a dark elf, bear in mind, decided she didn't want Marathi to have all this power and to have an area and to have essentially an an anarian substitute in her corner as well so this is kind of infighting between the dark elves so Tyrion gets free and engages Marathi in combat but she doesn't want to fight him so she kind of surprises him and kisses him on the lips and he's so stunned by this and it says repulsed but well we're not sure about that repulsed that he doesn't manage to land a strike or a blow and she manages to escape cleanly uh, she doesn't really get another opportunity to mess with Tyrion's head and make him into the kind of warped version of Anarian that he became so she kind of just went back to trying to get Malekith out of the realm of chaos she spent a century doing this and the best idea she could really come up with is to get the elven god Cain to free him from his ensnarement in the realms of chaos and she started multiplying her amount of blood sacrifices tenfold. She was killing slaves, she was killing elves, she was killing men. She was really just killing any kind of prisoner she could get her hands on to try and appease the elven god of murder, Cain, to free Malekith from the realms of chaos. After a while, she was like, okay, none of this is working. Let's see what else we've got. And she'd heard of these kind of mysterious creatures to the south of Nagaroth in Lustria and she said okay here's the task there will be great rewards for whoever can bring me the greatest gifts of sacrifice from the land south of us in Lustria and so vast armies of dark elves started to sail and march south to try and see what they could find in the jungles of Lustria and indeed they brought back many different kinds of lizard men and dinosaur like creatures and each was sacrificed and none seemed to satiate the god Cain 
And then eventually, after 12 years of these crusades into the lands of Lustria, one of the warring parties managed to come back with a slan mage priest who'd been lobotomized by an assassin during their conflict with the Lustrian lizardmen. And then doing her magic incantations and sacrificing one of the most one of these most powerful of magic users to the god of murder, Cain, she finally received a vision and knew all she had to do at this point was wait for the return of Malekith. A short time after this, a patrol of dark riders found the body of Malekith broken by the side of their northern watchtower and brought him back to his mother's care. Morathi cared for him with her dark magics and sorcery and it took over a year for Malekith to get back on his feet and he never really spoke about what happened to him in the realms of chaos. All that was ever really found was that in his side was lodged the horn of a demon and he'd obviously been very badly wounded. And Malekith had been slightly changed by the entire experience where his his flames of anger once existed his anger had taken on a much colder edge and he seemed like much more reserved in his rage and anguish and during this period again malachi focused the forces of the dark elves on raiding the allies high elves had since come to common cause with and they seemed to be forefront on the targets of on the dark elves vengeance and would often during this period be raided and pillaged by the dark elf fleets malachi also focused on the number of high elf colonies that still existed outside of orfwan and would attack these as as often as opportunities presented themselves orfwan itself had undergone another period of weakening wow grum had had a huge effect of a green-skinned horde washing over Ulfwan for the first time they'd ever encountered them really in their own homeland. And this had had a devastating effect on vast sways on the High Elves Island. And he used this to start to raid and pillage Yvres and they raided and ransacked this, the Dark Elves. So they're just making a complete nuisance of themselves for the High Elves all over the world without engaging in the kind of full-scale invasion we've seen in times gone by. One night during this period, in the capital city of Nagarond, Malekith was in his tower, and it was a night known as the Night of the Rites of Atari, which is essentially just kind of a pleasure festival, if you will. And during this night, portals to the realm of chaos started to open up, and none other than the greater demon Unkari emerged from the realms of chaos and began to storm Malekith's capital. Now, what Nkari was doing there was he was after revenge. What had transpired was when Malekith entered the realms of chaos, he and Malekith had come to blows over their previous agreement and had fought a fierce battle which presumably lasted many, many years. And this is what had ruined Malekith. And indeed, it was Nkari's broken horn that had been lodged into Malekith's side when he returned from the realm of chaos. And this essentially prompted a huge Slaneshi invasion of the capital city of Nagaron. But Malekith, who was upset that his forces couldn't handle this minor chaos incursion, was forced with the indignity of having to go down there and deal with it himself. Of course, he didn't run. That would be too undignified. So he kind of calmly strolled down from his tower. And whereupon they'd met in the warp and Malekith had survived of his life, that was a place where Nkari was at his most powerful and Malekith had already been weakened by the fact that he entered the warp in the midst of another battle. And he'd already been hurt by the, by the reignited flames of Assyrian, who very much damaged him. So he'd been hurt, and Ankara had been at his full power, and Malekith had still managed to survive. So Malekith was confident this time in Malekith's capital city, and Ankara being greatly weakened by being kind of in the realms of mortals that Malekith could handle it, and indeed he did. He managed to decapitate the greater demon and send it back into the realms of chaos. Having managed to bring Malekith back and have him kind of restoring himself back to full strength, managing to defeat a greater demon of chaos fairly nonchalantly, Morify began to kind of occupy herself with her own little projects. And one of these was to try and investigate more of the magic that existed with these slan mages that she'd encountered in sacrificing to the god Cain to return Malekith. And she'd kind of been working with Lufa Harkon, the vampire pirate of the coast of Lustria, in investigating the magics and the land of Lustria. So they're kind of working together, trying to get to the bottoms of the magic that's present there in last year and to try and take advantage of it for themselves. So that's a little side project she's kind of been working on. And that kind of brings us up to date with where things stand, I anticipate, with the introduction of the Dark Elves in Total War Warhammer. 
Many times Malekith has tried to take over Ulfwan and be named the Phoenix King. Many times he's been repelled, but he's constantly trying to rebuild his strength and strike back at the High Elves, who he still considers usurpers and have robbed him of his rightful place on the Phoenix throne. At this point, if you hadn't guessed already, essentially he and his mother have these kind of immortal bodies. Time won't really have an effect on them. They've lived millennia, they'll live for millennia more unless they're struck down by means of violence, essentially. And even then, who's to say if they'll actually die? Now, in terms of their abilities on the tabletop and how they might play in Total War Warhammer, Malekith, as you know from the story, is a sorcerer and a not bad warrior for, in his own right. He has access to the lore of dark magic, which is a lore of magic we don't have yet on the, in Total War Warhammer. His magical items also include his blade, known as the Destroyer, which he made himself with his knowledge of magic and metalwork. Now, this sword on the tabletop had the ability to destroy magical items in sort of opposing characters and opposing armies. Now, this has come up before in my Missing Legendary Lords videos as an ability, I, but this is an effect we haven't seen in Total War Warhammer yet of being able to essentially negate the power of a magical item on the opposing army. But it could maybe just take the form of negative melee attack, I think, the Destroyer. Or really maybe just present Malekith with some kind of magical resistance or magic damage resistance. Something along those lines. He also has the Armor of Midnight, which if he was ever struck on the tabletop with a, with a hit that would cause multiple wounds to him, that would be reduced down to one wound. And so the magic is essentially just a beefy armor. So what this would do is essentially really increase his armor itself and possibly give him some kind of physical resistance. That's what I see the Armor of Midnight doing. And the Armor of Midnight is, of course, the armor that was forged onto his body itself. He can't take it off because it's the only thing that could quell the flames of Assyrian and kind of negate the damage that had been done to him. He's essentially locked into this armor for the rest of his life. He also has an ability known as the Supreme Spell Shield, which essentially is just a magic resistance. And he has the Circlet of Iron, which he found in that wasted northern city, you'll remember. And this gives him superior magic casting ability. So maybe a buff to Winds of Magic Reserve or a buff to the speed at which he recovers Winds of Magic. It'll probably take the form of something like that in Total War Warhammer. He also has a Black Dragon. Now you might say, oh, I thought he lost his Black Dragon. He lost his first Black Dragon, but she gave birth to a number of different eggs, which the Dark Elves have hatched with Dark Magic. And so they now have a number of Black Dragons at their disposal. His current Black Dragon, I think is called uh, Seraphan. And that's what he's riding here in this model. And this Black Dragon has a Breath Weapon, known as Noxious Breath. It's not a fire weapon, it's Noxious Breath, which I think has a poisoning effect, if I'm not mistaken on that one. Let me know in the comments if I am, but I think that's what it does. And that about sums it up for the abilities that Malekith has on the tabletop and how I think they'll be translated over to Total War Warhammer. In terms of Morify, she has her, tr her trusty steed, the Dark Pegasus, Sulafet, who she rides into battle. She has access to the magic laws of death, of shadow and of dark. So three magic laws there. Because we have never seen a legendary lord with several laws of magic, one has to assume they might do what they did for maybe the branch race, maybe do a hybrid branch of magic for her with elements of all three of them. Or they might just say, okay, let's actually do this and give her several laws of magic, which would be really cool and would be my preferred choice when it comes to Morify. She also has a skill known as Enchanting Beauty because she is so smoking and wears so little. This is essentially something that would be translated over to Total Warhammer essentially as a melee skill debuff. It kind of just distracts the people fighting her. They are less likely to hit in the tabletop and that translates into Total War Warhammer as a melee skill debuff. She also has a skill known as the First Sorcerer, which essentially just makes her a better spellcaster. It gives her extra dice on the tabletop to cast magic spells. And essentially this would just be a magic buff and again probably just a winds of magic buff in terms of her reserve and her recharge rate to make her stand out and to make her a very powerful uh, magic user in total war warhammer a thousand and one dark blessings is yet another special rule that applies to her and this is essentially a ward save and magic resistance so essentially would be a tick on the upgrade tree i think rather than a magic item quest or anything like that that could give her magic resistance and the ward save as well. In terms of her magic items, she just has really her two blades, which are known as Heart Render and Dark Sword. 
and they give her increased magic, increased strength, and a, essentially lower enemy toughness. So maybe a drop to enemy melee defense in an aura around her is really a kind of accurate representation of how that could be represented in Total War Warhammer. And that sums it up for Morify. Now I hope that was informative guys, that was Malekith and Morify. They themselves almost accentuate the entire history of the Dark Elf people. They were the founding of the Dark Elf faction and they are its current rulers really. Well Malekith more than any other, but Morify I don't see not being included. Hi guys, as always thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video please do drop a like and do subscribe for more Total War Warhammer content. Uh, thanks all for watching. A special thank you goes out to my patrons, John, Reese, Colin, Thomas, and Matthias. Thank you guys, and I look forward to catching you all on the next one.